The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. I'm Donald Murphy, Marketing Programs Manager at PacBio, and I want to welcome everyone to the PacBio webinar, webinar series. The PacBio webinar series is a year-round offering that showcases cutting-edge research that takes advantage of the power of smart sequencing and provides insights and unique perspectives from top scientists, researchers, developers, and our industry ecosystem partners. It's my pleasure today to introduce our speakers who will present in the following order. Jonas Korlik, Chief Scientific Officer at PacBio, followed by Dave Corney, Associate Principal Scientist, Next Generation Sequencing at GeneWiz. The presentation portion of the webinar will be approximately 40 minutes, followed by a question and answer session. You're welcome to submit your questions at any point during the webinar by typing them in the area provided on your attendee dashboard. We'll endeavor to answer the questions in real time via the questions panel, as well as during the verbal Q&A portion at the end. We will be recording this webinar and making it available for download in the next few days, so please keep an eye out for a follow-up email with a link to the recording. Today, our topics include the advantages of smart sequencing, how the SQL System 6.0 update has brought game-changing performance across applications, some initial impressions and feedback from an early user, and achievements with high-fidelity reads. So with that, let's get started. Welcome, Jonas. Thank you very much, uh, Dono, and a warm welcome from me as well. Hello, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join um, this webinar today. It's uh, my pleasure to tell you about the latest advances in single molecule real-time sequencing and in particular, a new paradigm of long and accurate reads. So I just wanted to say hello, but I'll turn off my webcam now so that you can focus on the slides. So by way of introduction, um, Many of you will be familiar with uh, single molecule real-time sequencing, but uh, um, fundamentally, uh, smart sequencing is characterized by simultaneously providing uh, the highest quality of sequencing performance in all five aspects that are relevant. Uh, whenever you are evaluating really any sequencing technology, those five uh, categories that I've listed here are the ones you want to look at. And so, with regard to uh, PyCAD sequencing, we have long reads. The average read lengths of individual sequence reads are now many tens of kilobases in length. Um, you obviously want your result to be accurate. So there's high consensus accuracy with smart sequencing because uh, it's um, uh, free of systematic errors. Um, the, the errors that are there are uh, random. And so when you build consensus, you can get a highly accurate result achieving uh, greater than 99.999% of Q50 values, um, the threat score Q values. Um, the third aspect is relevant with regard to being able to sequence all the DNA that's part of your sample. So having uniform coverage and no bias with regard to either GC content or sequence complexity, that will then allow you to get the same kind of quality, the long reads and the high consensus accuracy, regardless of what the DNA sequence is. Uh, of course, single molecule real-time sequencing is has single molecule resolution, and it can give you long reads with high single molecule accuracy. And that is the prerequisite of the ability to resolve very complex mixtures. Uh, this is important, for example, in uh, resolving transcriptomes or metagenomic mixtures or uh, uh, tumor samples where you have uh, minor variants and so forth. And then fifth, uh, the ability to detect epigenetic markers, methylation, or um, product of DNA damage to characterize the epigenome without the need to have a separate sample preparation. Now, as you know, initially, this came at the cost of a much lower throughput than um, other uh, technologies, the next generation uh, sequencing systems. And so what we've done over the past six years is to increase on this foundation of high quality of data, uh, the throughput of the system by now over 2,000 fold improvement of the throughput first on the first commercial instrument, the PecBio RS2, which is shown here, and now on the SQL system. And so uh, currently with the current, with the latest chemistry that I want to talk about in detail, uh, the throughput gets up to um, 20 gigabases per smart cell for genomic DNA and up to 50 gigabases per smart cell for amplicon. And in the SQL system, it is possible currently to run up to 12 smart cells in a walkaway operation per machine run. And so uh, that gives you per machine run uh, quite, a, quite a good throughput that is then opening up uh, new applications that perhaps previously a few years ago 
would not have been uh, possible. So then um, I'm delighted to tell you more about the SQL System 6 release. That's our latest release. Uh, and it is both a software uh, release as well as a chemistry release. Uh, quickly with regard to the software, there's some instrument control software improvements in the primary and post-primary analysis and some reliability improvements. With regard to the SmartLink analysis package, that's the secondary analysis, there are a lot of improvements. I only want to highlight two of them, which are major updates. The first one is with regard to structure variant calling. In this new major update, in addition to deletions and insertions, which were previously um, uh, called with the previous version of the structure variant caller, it now includes additional variant types, inversions, translocations, and it even um, goes into the indel uh, region. Structure variants are typically defined as variation that's greater than 50 base pairs. And so indels um, between one and 50 base pairs um, are now accessible as part of the structure variation calling uh, as it calls small indels that are greater than 20 base pairs. You now get base pair precise variant calls. So there's consensus calling on the breakpoint. Uh, so you get precise boundaries of those particular uh, variants. And the software has been improved to include a faster runtime and a more scalable workflow. The second major update um, in the SmartLink uh, 6.0 uh, package is the release of ISOSeq 3. So ISOSeq, the ISOSeq method is a full length RNA seq um, application. And the software has been improved to have dramatically faster runtime, improved stability and scalability, and the unified support for demultiplexing when you pool different tissues or different samples. Um, they have, they're now supported for the demultiplexing. But then at the heart of the SQL System 6 release is the new consumables, the new sequencing chemistry, um, which we call the version 3.0 polymerase and sequencing plate and uh, smart cell chemistry. So with regard to binding kits, internal controls, sequencing plates, and smart cells, we have these new reagents. And I would like to tell you about the uh, performance characteristics. Uh, just as before, there's a different set of performance parameters regarding large insert libraries uh, and amplicons. Um, so I want to start with large insert libraries first. And what I've listed here is the uh, performance of the new chemistry relative to what the previous chemistry, the version 5.1, um, was that so you can see that there's roughly a uh, approximately a doubling of the throughput per smart cell up to 20 gigabases compared to up to 10 gigabases before and this is largely mediated by an increase in the average read length uh, going to up to 30 kilobases uh, from up to 20 kilobases here's an example of a uh, um, about 35 kilobase insert size human um, genome library and you can see that in this 10 hour run um, you get 15 gigabases of data, about half a million reads, and the mean read length is about uh, 29,000 bases, and the read N50 is uh, over 40,000 bases. Um, of course, an 80,000 base read is, has twice as many bases compared to a 40,000 base read, so most of the data will actually be in this, uh, on the right-hand side of this distribution, and so this N50 values of utility, that's the average, that's the read length beyond which half of the data are contained. So half of the data are in reads greater than 43,000 bases. I often get the question um, with regard to the runtime. I mentioned this as a 10 hour movie, and it is possible in the SQL system to run uh, longer up to 20 hours. And for this particular application, you can see that for long insert libraries, the benefits of running beyond 10 hours are very modest because most of the uh, sequence reads have finished at 10 hours and there's only a small fraction of polymerases that are still going, they will give rise to these very long reads in excess of 200,000 bases. However, as a, on a whole, you don't get much more throughput going from 15 to 17 gigabases. You don't get a lot more uh, reads and also the read length increases are very modest. So consequently, for this particular application of long insert libraries, we would not recommend the 20 hour uh, movie mode because obviously if you run two smart cells at 10 hours, you would get um, something like 30 gigabases out instead of uh, 17 gigabases over the uh, same time frame. Now, uh, we have um, made improvements. Um, additionally, in terms of the raw read accuracy, which means that the consensus accuracy uh, curve uh, gets to a high consensus sooner. You need less coverage to get to, let's say, Q30, Q30, Q40, and Q50. Um, so you can see here that with the new chemistry 
At about 20-fold coverage, you reach Q40, that's 99.99%. And at 40-fold coverage, you reach about Q50, or 99.999%. Um, and so the errors continue to be random, so you can see that you get a very high consensus um, that reaches greater than QV60 values with the appropriate coverage. And similarly to before, we have maintained the high quality of a lack of bias. Um, this is on a human genome sample. On the x-axis, you see the GC percentage. Um, so this is very AT-rich regions of the genome. These are very GC-rich regions of the genome to the right side here. And you can see that there's a very flat profile and very even coverage, regardless of what the GC content looks like. And so you get the same kind of quality um, for AT-rich, for repetitive regions, for low-complexity regions. And that's the prerequisite for getting comprehensive, complete uh, genomes uh, and genome assemblies. Now, there's an even bigger improvement with uh, what we call shorter insert libraries. And so with shorter insert libraries, I mean anything spanning from between, let's say, one kilobase insert up to about 20 kilobase inserts. And you can see that there is a more than doubling of both the throughput and the average read length, going from up to 20 gigabases to up to 50 gigabases in terms of the throughput and going from up to 40 gigabases average read length up to 100 kilobases, uh, 40 kilobases average read length um, to up to 100 kilobases of average read length. So on average, the reads can be as high uh, as 100 kilobases. And you may ask, how is it possible to have such a substantial improvement? We believe that this is uh, one of the, if not the most uh, important chemistry update that we've ever done on the platform. And so we have accomplished this by introducing a step before sequencing, which we've called pre-extension. Um, so here in this cartoon, you see the DNA molecule to be sequenced, and yellow is the forward strand, and then purple is the reverse strand. And uniquely in PEC biosequencing, uh, we ligate these hairpin adapters on both ends of the linear double-stranded DNA to make a topologically circular molecule. On one end, the primer is bound, and then the polymerase is bound. Um, to then going and get going in the sequencing. And so what, we have, what we're doing during this pre-extension is to get the polymerase going in the dark. So we haven't turned on the lasers. We haven't um, uh, started the acquisition. And so when the polymerase gets going here, and you can see in this cartoon, uh, it synthesizes a complementary strand and thereby opens up the smart bill, as we call this template, and then gets into this rolling circle synthesis. So it's now keeping synthesizing on what is now the circular template. And we found that this is a very stable configuration. So the polymerase is very processive, it's very stable, and it can uh, sequence uh, tens and, and up to 100,000 bases on average. The second benefit of this pre-extension is that uh, before we start the measurement, the polymerase checks every base on the template and makes sure it can be sequenced. So it, um, it rules out that there are damaged bases or nicks in the DNA strand and so forth. And so um, DNA molecules that may have been damaged are weeded out, are filtered out. And so now we're going to turn on the laser and start the acquisition. And so now the polymerase is very stable and um, uh, very processive and gives rise to lots and lots of these subreads. So a subread is one of those passes uh, from the polymerase on these. Uh, so here's one subread on the uh, purple strand and then going around sequencing the reverse strand. So with this technology, it's possible to sequence the same base of the same DNA molecule multiple times, get information from both strands, and that then allows you to get a very highly accurate consensus sequence on a single individual DNA molecule. And we call this mode of sequencing circular consensus sequencing. You don't need a lot of passes to get to uh, a fairly high accuracy. So about four passes will get you to Q20 or 99% accurate read, and about nine passes are needed currently to get to about Q30 or 99.9% accurate. Reads. And so then depending on the insert size, um, you can see that you get hundreds of thousands of uh, either Q20 or Q30 reads. Of course, there are more, the uh, smaller the insert size at 1 kb, for example, because uh, you'll have many, many passes, which gives you um, a very high yield. But even at um, an average insert size of about 10 kilobases, with, and now it makes sense to increase the movie time because we get more passes and the polymerase is still going, you still get a, a quarter million Q20 reads at 10 kb uh, insert size and still over 100,000 Q30 reads at this particular insert size. So this is a, a shift that we now, um, we've lived in a world where you have uh, short and accurate reads and long um, reads with a lot of error, 
this is a new paradigm where we can get long and accurate reads at the same time. So here's an example of a, a 10 kilobase insert human genome sample. And you can see that the read length distribution, the shape has really shifted and the peak has shifted to reads that are uh, mostly uh, very long. So the N50, half of the data is in reads that are greater than 167,000 bases. And so correspondingly, the yield is much higher and still the number of reads is about the same at a half a million. This was run with eight hour pre extension. And you can see that over 280,000 reads are greater than 99% uh, accurate. So I want to give a few examples in different application spaces of where long and accurate reads are of great uh, benefit and, and can, um, uh, can be utilized. The first one is in amplicon sequencing. And the slides uh, I will be showing, um, I borrowed from Scott, Stuart Scott's uh, presentation at the American Society of Human Genetics meeting a few months ago. Uh, Stuart is, uh, has a dual appointment at Mount Sinai in Singapore. His talk is also was recorded and is available at this um, uh, link. And um, so Stuart is interested in amplicon sequencing of uh, medically or pharmacogenomically important genes. Here's one example of CYP2D6, a very important gene in pharmacogenomics. And so um, what's shown here in the bottom is an IGB view of long and accurate reads that span the full length of the CYP2D6 gene that's um, close to 7,000 bases. You can see the whole window here is 8.3 kilobases. And um, each of the lines um, the, in blue is the forward direction read and in the reverse, is in, in pink is the reverse direction read. Each of the lines represent a single uh, highly accurate and full length read that spans the entire CYP2D6 gene. And you can see that it's now very easy to separate, segregate the two clusters of reads into the two haplotypes. So this is the maternal allele and here's the paternal allele. And you can also see immediately that all the heterozygous single nucleotide variants are immediately phased, showing that in this particular example, all the single nucleotide variation that differs from the reference is associated with one allele and the second allele is actually concordant with the reference. And so the data, um, uh, was compared to uh, previous genotyping results, and they had a very high concordance, just about 100 samples. And the data was such high quality that in 10% of the uh, cases, the haplotypes were revised or uh, determined as novel by smart sequencing, whether there was a lower confidence from the genotype result. Um, just two more examples. This is another pharmacogenomically uh, important gene that's now larger. It's 11,000 bases in length. And again, you can see how clean the data is with regard to giving long and accurate reads um, and segregating out into the two alleles. And of course, this is very complementary to what you would uh, obtain with the short read uh, technologies where you can detect the heterozygous mutations in all cases. But um, if you need the information from the phasing into the two alleles, then that's the information that the PecBio uh, SQL system 3.0 chemistry can provide. And um, not just single nucleotide variation. Here I have zoomed out and showed that there's a, a heterozygous insertion of 25 bases um, that is very clearly resolved. And you can see how clean each of those rows, again, is uh, a single individual PecBio read. And then pushing the envelope, um, this is a 20,000 base amplicon for a Mendelian disease gene. And again, you can see, so we're losing we don't have enough pixel resolution on our screens because these reads are so long. These are 20,000 bases in length. And again, you can see over this entire distance how easily and how cleanly the two haplotypes separate and how you get complete information about this particular gene um, for a uh, human genome sample. The second application that I'd like to mention with regard to utility of the new 3.0 chemistry is the isoseq method. So this is full length RNA sequencing. And again, of course, this is very complementary to uh, short read uh, RNA seq. With short read um, next generation sequencing uh, RNA seq, you get a lot of counts for gene expression uh, profiling, um, but you don't necessarily get as much information about transcript structure and alternative splicing. And so um, uh, this is very well complemented by the isoseq method, which gives you full length um, RNA sequencing reads. And you can see that there's benefit with the 3.0 chemistry compared to the 2.1 chemistry in terms of longer polymerase read lengths, greater yields, which then translates to a higher percentage of full length reads 
that then trans results in more unique genes and more unique transcripts, so that recovers uh, about 20% more genes compared to the previous 2.1 chemistry. Um, I should mention that this was um, these data were presented by my colleague Elizabeth Tseng, also at the ASHG 2018 meeting, and similarly, this talk was recorded and is available at this uh, same link location. Um, so then, finally, as the third example, I would like to highlight um, what might be possible with this type of paradigm where you have long and accurate, about 10 to 20 kilobase long reads that have a comparable accuracy to the uh, next generation sequencing short reads. As you know, there's different types of variation in the human genome, and um, this variation can be addressed uh, with the short read technologies very um, uh, economically and in high throughput for the single nucleotide variants and some of the indels. And then we have the application of local coverage in smart sequencing to get at structure variants. And so we were interested whether it may be possible um, to complement those two uh, different application spaces with an assay that utilizes these high fidelity reads and uh, access um, um, preferably all of this type of variation. So we just um, apply a sample, a very well characterized sample. This is a HT002 as part of the Genome in the Bottle Consortium. Um, this particular sample has been subjected to essentially all known sequencing technologies. And so we um, the two data sets, a 10 kilobase average size and a 15 kilobase average size shear and then size selected library. And we ran um, about to about 30 fold and 20 fold, 28 fold coverage respectively. The data of the high fidelity reads is um, in the public domain. It is deposited in the um, genome in the bottle um, uh, depository. And so you can, you can access them and download them uh, freely available. Um, so then with regard to first the um, taking these types of data and looking at structure variation detection, we found that there is a um, moderate benefit of using the high fidelity CCS reads over the raw reads. So you can see there's a, a little bit of an increase of recalling the high confidence um, structure variation events that are part of the genome in the bottle benchmark set. And uh, I've listed down here an example of um, structure variations in an exon of the MUC2 gene. So you can see here that there are, um, there is a um, heterozygote. So again, these are segregated in the two haplotypes. And you can see that in one of the haplotypes, there's uh, over here a 21 base deletion. That's a heterozygous deletion. And then here you have a heterozygous insertion. But interestingly, there is an insertion in both haplotypes. However, they are of different lengths. So you can see that in haplotype one, the insertion is 333 basis long. And in the second haplotype, it's 405 basis long. I want to note that all three of these structure variants are of a size that's divisible by three, which makes sense because it's in an exon, and so it preserves the translation reading frame. And also, I want to note that you can see that these structure variants are very nicely phased with the single nucleotide variants that are shown in these colored uh, bar. So again, you can see how clean the data is that you get to get you the full information about what's happening for both alleles in this particular region. And so just a couple more examples for um, how this uh, looks in the PEC bio data. Um, so here is an example of a gene that's related to autism, again showing full length reads uh, that can clearly be clustered into the two alleles, one being concordant with the reference and the other having uh, multiple insertions here. This is um, facilitated by the long reads and is more challenging with the short reads because they're tandem repeats that make the mapping of the uh, NGS reads more challenging. Um, but then um, the new aspect of the high fidelity CCS reads is that they are intrinsically highly accurate, so you can also do single nucleotide variant detection. And again, we're comparing the SMB concordance with the genome and the bottom benchmark set in the high confidence region. So those are regions where by multiple technology, the Genome in the Bottle Consortium has um, determined that these single nucleotide variants are there. And you can see that there's excellent concordance of the high fidelity CCS reads with this benchmark set. Um, there's 99.6% recall and 99.6% um, uh, precision in our, in our first uh, analysis of this data. And so you can now put this all together. I realize this is a complex and busy slide, but I want to point your attention 
So what is shown here is um, uh, NGS data and then PEC bio data phased by the two alleles relative to the genome in the bottle uh, benchmark set. So I want to focus your attention to these two tracks up here. In, in the gray bars are the genome in the bottle high confidence call sets. And then uh, below the blue and the red are the corresponding SNFs that were called with the CCS PEC bio high fidelity data. And so you can see that in some cases, um, the PEC bio data is, is able to call single nucleotide variation where there isn't a uh, high confidence data set. So um, just, just as one example, looking at the genome, um, again, um, looking at the location where the CYP2D6 gene that I talked about earlier uh, in a targeted setting, but now from whole genome sequencing. So CYP2D6 in this particular data set is located within a 750 kilobase phase block. So over almost a megabase, the uh, variants are completely phased. And then the CYP2D6 gene is, is in here in this very small portion. So we're zooming into uh, this particular region. Here you see the gene CYP2D6. Right next to it is a pseudogene uh, CYP2D7. And these are segmental duplications, which is part of the reason why um, this is difficult to uh, map and call. Also, you can see that it's very polymorphic. There are many, many different uh, single nucleotide variants. And so you can see that the PEC bio data, again, in blue and red, are uh, calling many, many more single nucleotide variants. So there are three aspects that I want to highlight with this um, paradigm of high fidelity CCS reads. You can look at structure variants. You can now look at single nucleotide variants that are um, as a, as a complementary uh, data sets to what's being called uh, very uh, economically and in high throughput with the NGS data. And you can access in this complementary fashion um, uh, SNPs that uh, you may not have been able to call with the short read technology. So then um, this new paradigm we see uh, as, a, as a very exciting addition to um, the current workflow where, of course, it is possible to use the uh, short read NGS platforms to get at um, the single nucleotide variants in a very high throughput and in a very cost effective way. And uh, you may be able to get all the information that uh, you may need or uh, diagnose the causative reason, uh, uh, cause, uh, the genetic causes of disease and so forth. But for certain samples where that is not sufficient, you can now complement that with the PEC bio data set of high quality, high fidelity CCS reads that are about two orders of magnitude longer, but have the same type of accuracy, the same type of bioinformatics tools can be used. You notice that we're using the GATK um, bioinformatics tool set that has been um, developed and improved upon and optimized for, for many decades, and then get additional information beyond the SNPs. You get uh, structure variation, you phase the alleles, um, have more confident alignments for pseudogenes, for repeat regions, and have even coverage um, that uh, covers some of the regions that maybe, maybe dropped out. So we're excited about this new paradigm as a uh, useful addition for uh, human whole genome sequencing. And the impact, of course, is um, uh, I want to illustrate in just one example. This has been um, commented by many in the community with regard to uh, going towards precision medicine. This is a very detailed uh, review article by Ewan Ashley at the Stanford University, who points out that there, of course, is a lot of power with the next generation sequencing technologies. Um, but um, some of the more complex genomic regions uh, can be challenging. And he points out that they're only challenging because of um, the nature of the NGS short read sequencing methods. And so um, there is a nice complement now with the PEC bio data that you can now look at some of these more uh, complex regions in the genome and uh, be able to highlight those and resolve those. Um, and then lastly, with regard to uh, going to de novo assemblies of human genomes uh, using this type of approach, I want to introduce that with the um, update that by now uh, we know over 40 publicly available assemblies that have used PEC bio sequencing and have created high quality human genome assemblies. If you look at the NCBI uh, database, over half of all human genome assemblies are now done, um, were done with PEC bio technology. And if you ask about the high quality de novo assemblies of human genome, the vast majority, 94% of them, uh, have been performed with PEC bio sequencing. So on our website at this link, we have an interactive map of the de novo assemblies of human genomes that now have um, comprised many different ethnicities 
And this map is interactive, so you can click on any one of these and it gives you the link to the NCBI accession and the additional information about these particular genomes and the particular project. Um, and so um, this particular data set of high fidelity CCS reads has been applied to human uh, de novo assemblies and we can compare it to the more recent um, uh, platinum quality um, human genome assemblies by the McDowell Genome Institute um, for different ethnicities. We had also contributed with a Puerto Rican um, uh, sample with the 2.1 chemistry. And you can see that uh, with this CCS approach, you get the same kind of high quality um, of completeness, the length of the genome, um, and contiguity. The contigen 50s are very large and the number of contigs um, is, is very small. And so what I want to note is that with the CCS reads, you need much less coverage, much less physical coverage, whereas in the uh, traditional approach, you need about 70 to 80-fold coverage. Now you only need about 30-fold coverage. In addition, there's a dramatic reduction in the computational uh, burden and effort that's needed, about 100,000 CPU hours uh, needed for the traditional assembly, uh, down by about a factor of 40, only about 2,500 hours. And that's because uh, you already have long and accurate reads, so you don't need error correction anymore, which is a very time intensive step, and you can go straight into the overlap, uh, overlap step of the assembler. Uh, we've been pleased by the adoption and the interest of the bioinformatics community. This was a tweet by Jason Chin. He only uh, used, uh, used a different assembler and only took him 150 CPU hours to get a very decent uh, human assembly. And then as a second example, Arang Ri, who works with Sergey Korn and Adam Filippi at the uh, NIH, applied their um, allele resolved trio binning approach and using this 15 KB high fidelity CCS read paradigm, uh, they were able to fully segregate the maternal haplotype and the paternal haplotype with excellent contiguity. So with these advanced assemblers, it's now possible to finally represent a diploid human genome as it is in the biological reality that of course we all have two copies of the genome that are not identical, uh, one inherited from the mother and one inherited from the father. And this can now be expressed using this data type and uh, these uh, new assemblers. So um, with that, I'd like to close, but not before, uh, of course, um, highlighting that uh, we're, we're not done yet with this um, evolution of improving the throughput on uh, the smart uh, technology. And so beyond um, the latest chemistry release that was the focus of this talk, I want to give a little um, view of what's to come. Uh, this is part of our roadmap that we started, that we announced at the beginning of the year and we have delivered so far on all the uh, items. There is a new uh, V2 Express Library prep kit coming, but then with regard to throughput in 2019 um, will be the introduction of the 8M Smart Cell, uh, improving the, increasing the multiplex to 8 million compared to the 1 million uh, that it is now, so by a factor of eight, and that will bring about a significant throughput increase. And I'm very pleased to share with you some early results from our research and development department. So these are R&D results uh, from prototype cells. Again, broken out first on the long insert samples. These are human samples. So you can see that on the 8M smart cell, these are two uh, runs. You get about a factor of eight improvement. Again, these are 10 hour runs. So the runs are much faster than with some other long read technologies. And so you get about 100 gigabases. Um, again, eightfold higher uh, increase in the number of reads and already very comparable mean read lengths and then 50 read lengths. And so here I've listed on the right the uh, corresponding read length histograms. We have tested this for other samples of different types beyond human. Uh, this, these are two bacterial samples. This is a plant sample. And so you can see that uh, you get between 80 and, and maybe in some cases or over 100 gigabases of data, about 5 million reads and a comparable uh, read length. And these are the underlying distributions. And then finally, with regard to high fidelity reads, uh, this is a comparison of the data that I showed you with the 1M system and now with the uh, prototype cells, early results for the 8M system. Again, you can see about an eightfold increase in the overall throughput, 320 gigabases of data from a single smart cell. Those are by far the highest throughputs that have been obtained to my knowledge with any long read technology. Um, and again, with terms of the number of reads, um, and then here you can see that with regard to the read length, we're already very much on par, or in some cases even exceeding uh, what's possible today with the 1M system. 
and um, uh, read length N50s of well over 160 kilobases, which then translates in a large number of very high quality, uh, greater than Q20 reads and um, uh, throughput in the high accuracy. So this uh, paradigm of long and accurate read scales uh, and the chemistry scales over to the 8M system. So that was a bit of a teaser into the future. We certainly hope that these improvements will continue to accelerate the application areas with regard to uh, looking at human genomes with regard to structure variation for the low fold coverage application or calling all the variants either in the de novo assembly or with the HiFi uh, reads and, and facilitating uh, many, many more samples uh, to be measured in the future. Um, so uh, this was the teaser for the future. I want to come back and um, uh, the focus of this webinar was, of course, what you can do with the system today. And we believe that it's a very powerful technology to experience comprehensive genomics uh, by delivering valuable insights that were previously unavailable to the scientific community. Uh, the SQL system uh, provides an unmatched depth of genetic information through the combination of long reads and high consensus accuracy for the different applications, either for whole genome sequencing with inserts that are greater than 20 kilobases, and I've talked in detail about these performance characteristics, or for targeted sequencing, um, the new HiFi approach, and for full-length RNA sequencing or isoseq applications um, with insert sizes for uh, between 1 and 20 kilobases. So with that, I will close, and um, uh, I'd like to now pass it on to Dave, but only to say that in the context that uh, PacBio has a large network of certified service providers, and we're certainly very grateful for their uh, adoption and um, uh, of the technology and making that available to the scientific community. So we're pleased um, to have Gene with present. And I'll turn it over to Dave um, uh, just to mention that uh, we often also partner. Uh, so in addition to the excellent service that the PacBio cert certified service providers uh, provide, we often partner with them on the Smart Grant program. And so we, uh, as we have done in the past, over the uh, course of the year, we have many Smart Grant programs in all these different areas and um, with multiple applications. So if you're interested in this, uh, please go to PACB.com Smart Grant. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll turn it over to Donald and Dave now. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, Dave, let me just pass the presenter baton to you. So you should now have that. Thank you, Donald. And uh, thank you, everybody, for um, joining us today. It is my pleasure to tell you a little bit about our experiences here at GeneWiz, which is a certified service provider. And we've had the opportunity to do some beta testing over the last couple of months on the, on the SQL 3.0 chemistry. So I'm going to turn my webcam off now. I just wanted to say hi. And so now you can concentrate on, uh, on the slides. So as I said, um, GeneWiz is a pack by a certified service provider, and we started offering the SQL service back in around 2016. And since that time, we have obviously handled a very wide range of sample types, many of which are shown here on the screen. And we've also worked on many different applications. So we have developed and optimized some of the protocols surrounding whole genome sequencing ISOSeq and Amplicon sequencing since 2016. And so we really wanted to take a similar strategy while evaluating the chemistry 3.0. So towards this, we have selected a few different case studies, and I will show you some data from them today. The first project is actually a smart grant winning project um, where we did whole genome sequencing and ISO seq sequencing for a novel cavefish. And then after that, I will tell you about some multiplexed microbial whole genome sequencing using 10 KB library preps. And then finally, we will touch on some small amplicon sequencing and, uh, and conclude from there. So as I just mentioned, this project was um, a multi-omic project to uh, compare the genome of a very new, newly discovered fish um, a, a cave fish that was discovered in uh, Germany in 2015. And so this project was the winner of the PAG 2018 Smart Grants competition, 
one by Arnie Nault and Fritz Sadlizak. You can see in uh, picture B uh, the, the cave fish. So this is a cave fish found obviously in, in a cave and is adapted to the very different environment than what is found um, in the surface population, which is uh, shown here. So you can see there's a very obvious difference in the coloration of the fish. They have longer barbels, smaller eyes, and, and larger nostrils, all of which show that this fish is uniquely adapted for the environment in this particular environment. So it's a very nice model to study the evolution of these traits. So first, it's a very young organism. Secondly, and really quite interestingly, is evolved independently to the Mexican cave fish, which many of you may be more familiar with. So we've taken a multi-omic approach to use pack bio whole genome sequencing combined with isoseq to characterize the germline and the transcriptome of this cave fish. So first, we performed whole genome sequencing with a 20 kb library prep and 15 kb blue pippin size selection. And this library was sequenced over four smart cells with 2.1 chemistry to obtain around 34 GB of data with typical metrics as shown on the right here. So on average, we saw around 8.5 GB of raw data and around 14 KB polymerase read lengths. We then took the same library and sequenced on a 3.0 uh, smart cell. And as you see on the right hand side, the lower right, the data amount is quite significantly increased up to 11.5 GB. So that's around 35% higher output on a per smart cell basis. So the polymerase read length was comparable, although uh, as we just heard from Jonas, the average read length doesn't tell the whole story and the N50 uh, was higher. So these longer reads uh, really contribute and, and impact to obtaining a, a high quality assembly. So we did take the data from the 2.1 and the 3.0 um, uh, sequencing, combined them together for an assembly and find a very nice assembly as, as shown here with these metrics. So this is still a work in progress and uh, Fritz and Arnie Nolts are, are uh, continuing to work on this and combining this data with some other methodologies to further improve uh, the, the quality of this assembly. However, in the meantime, we have continued to perform the transcriptome characterization of this organism using ISOSeq. So we prepared an ISOSeq library, and this library was sequenced on 2.1 smart cells as well as 3.0. So as we can see again on the right hand side, the data amount is significantly increased with the 3.0 chemistry. So we see around 17 GB of data with 3.0, 25 KB average polymerase read length and 53 KB uh, polymerase N50. So the data analysis for uh, this data set is still ongoing and we're looking forward to presenting it at PAG, but briefly we're looking to use this data to annotate the genome assembly that we have already obtained, as well as comparing the transcriptome and the genome to the Mexican cave fish, as I mentioned in the introduction. So switching gears to microbial whole genome sequencing, so there's multiple approaches that one can take to sequence uh, any genome on uh, the SQL platform. And in particular for the microbial genomes, there is a variety of approaches which may take um, uh, advantage of various uh, size selection strategies. So a few years ago, it was proposed to classify genomes based upon uh, the repeat sizes and, and structure. So for example, a class one genome may have few repeats except for a ribosomal RNA operate operon around five to seven KB. In contrast, class three genomes tend to have very large uh, phase re related repeats uh, greater than seven KB. So depending on the organism, one may take slightly different approaches. Nevertheless, all of these multiplexing approaches really significantly decrease the cost 
as well as the time and DNA starting requirements um, to actually get the, the assembly at the end. So again, we took six uh, microbes, uh, prepared libraries for them using a multiplexing approach that in this case did not take advantage of uh, size selection, but was sequenced uh, as one pool on one smart cell. And so this sequencing on the 2.1 and the 3.0 uh, smart cells, the, the output from that is shown here. And again, consistent with the previous results I've shown, the data output is significantly improved compared to the 2.1. So both on a raw data amount, as well as the polymerase read length, uh, the, the performance is much uh, improved. Now, one thing I will just point out here is that although we've seen uh, longer polymerase read lengths, what we really like to see is this impact to the sub-read length. And so it's not terribly obvious here, but actually the average sub-read length is increased by around 1 kb between the 2.1 and 3.0. And what this actually means is that now um, you're able to better span the, those repeats that are found within uh, the genome. So taken together, after assembly with uh, the 3.0 data set, we actually found fewer contigs for these microbes and closing some of these genomes as well. So then with the time remaining, I'm going to focus on amplicon sequencing. And so as a certified service provider, we see a very wide range of amplicons being sent to us for sequencing. This really spans the gamut from uh, small amplicons up to large, as well as spanning the gamut of amplicon diversity. So an example may be a full length 16S amplicon, which is fairly small, around 1.5, 1.6 KB, but may be incredibly diverse. In contrast, um, we uh, also see um, very long amplicons, such as STR repeat analysis amplicons. These amplicons can be very long, but are typically not very diverse. So they're typically going to be homozygote or heterozygote uh, alleles. In any case, the uh, longer polymerase read lengths that we've seen up until now for the whole genome and isoseq sequencing applications are really helpful for amplicon sequencing as well. So having a longer polymerase read length allows you to sequence longer amplicons and to sequence those longer amplicons with greater single molecule accuracy. In addition, it also increases the opportunity for multiplexing of these amplicons. So there are a number of factors which impact the polymerase read length. These um, include the amplicon length itself. So a smaller amplicon is easier to get into that rolling circle mode that Jonas mentioned and therefore deliver a longer polymerase read length. There are also things that we can do on the SQL instrument itself, such as we can adjust the pre-extension time, we can adjust the on-plate molarity and so forth. So I already said that the polymerase read length is really important and I just want to highlight here uh, why that's the case. So we see in this movie the polymerase moving around the uh, smart bell template and as it passes through the same region of that template multiple times the accuracy of those base calls improves with each pass. So we could imagine a polymerase read length of 30 kb. This may allow for 30 passes of a 1 kb template and with each pass we see increased single molecule accuracy. So we have taken a 2.5 kb amplicon and sequenced that on both 2.1 and 3.0 sequel chemistry. And again, we see an increase in the amount of data. So here we see an uh, increase from 10 to 15 GB, which is around 50% increase. Now we did notice in this particular uh, run of, of this library that there was a fewer number of reads that were uh, obtained. Now this is really down to the loading of, of this particular library and with further titration and optimization, uh, we're fully expecting that the total number of reads will equal or surpass 
the 2.1 uh, data amounts. Nevertheless, what is really nice to see again is the longer polymerase read length and how this has impacted the, the CCS reads. So we've seen over a hundred percent increase in the polymerase read length and consistent with this, the number of CCS passes has increased from nine to 16. So when we look at the quality of these reads after the CCS read generation, we see that although the total number of raw reads on the 3.0 smart cell was a little lower, the number of very high quality reads is far higher. So for example, QV20 reads, um, we uh, obtained around 150 one chemistry, yet over 220,000 with 3.0. So to conclude and to look to the future, so I hope that uh, I've been able to convincingly show you that the data yields and data quality is uh, firmly on the right track and uh, improving with this uh, new chemistry release. We're really enthusiastic and excited to see what it's going to do for both large and small genome sequencing. We're seeing that it's making it more cost effective by reducing the number of smart cells that are needed and I think that we're soon going to be at a stage where it will be cost effective to sequence a population of organisms, such as a population of cave fish, rather than picking an individual. The polymerase read length improvements that we have seen have now offered an even more, um, an even higher ability to multiplex both short and long amplicons and obtain high single molecule fidelity regardless of, of the amplicon size. And so taken together, we're really enthusiastic and, and looking forward to seeing the novel applications that we're envisioning, uh, both within the research space as well as in clinical diagnostic space. So I will finish here and uh, thank you for your attention and for attending the webinar today. I'd also like to thank my colleagues, both at GeneWiz and at PacBio as well as thank our collaborators, Arnie Nolt and Fritz Sedlizak. I'd be happy to take some questions uh, right now, or you can also use the contact information on the screen to contact me later. Thank you, Dave, uh, and thank you, Jonas. Uh, we do have uh, some questions that have come in, and, and to our attendees, a reminder that if you have questions, you can uh, feel free to I typed them into the chat window, and in the time that we will uh, have left, we'll we'll try to get through as many as we can. So, uh, jumping right in, uh, this first question is for you, Jonas. The question is: Is a subread all the way around smart bell, bell template, or only halfway around? It's halfway around. So, a subread is either the forward or the reverse strand for the smart bell. Okay. Um, another question for you, Jonas, um, is the coverage required for consensus accuracy the same for multi-molecule and single molecule or CCS? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, fundamentally, it's the same. So the system is ergodic, meaning uh, 10 passes over one molecule is the same as one pass over 10 molecules. And so the curves that I showed with regard to the coverage um, and the consensus accuracy are the same. Uh, regardless of whether you are building consensus from multiple molecules that have single passes or from one molecule that has multiple passes or any combination in between. Okay, thank you. And then keeping with CCS, is CCS still needed to achieve 99% accuracy? Yeah, so as I, as I mentioned just now, it depends on the application in the CCS mode. Um, to get to a 99% accurate uh, result, you have two uh, options. So in CCS, uh, you would get to 99% with about four passes, as I showed. But you can also get to a 99% accurate result on multiple reads that come from the same region. And so, you know, consequently, you would need 4x coverage, uh, four reads, um, and then you could do a multi-molecule consensus to get to the same type of, of accuracy. But if you want to get to that at the single molecule level, yes, then the CCS mode would be needed. Okay, and then just jumping over to you, Dave, uh, we have a question. The uh, question is, were the GeneWiz CaveFish ISOSeq libraries size-selected? I uh, know these were not size-selected. Um, it's a good question, though. Uh, one of the advantages, though, of sequencing 
on the sequel compared to the historical RS2 protocol is that the site selection isn't actually a firm requirement, although it is optional to sequence some of the longer ISO forms if those are of specific interest. Okay, thank you. Um, and keeping with you, Dave, uh, have you done PacBio amplicon sequencing of highly variable targets such as HIV? Um, yes, I, I believe so. Um, um, yes. Okay. Um, and then um, jumping back to you, Jonas, uh, question is how are 10 hour movies different from 20 hour movies? Is it, uh, is it the coverage? So the, the 10 hour movies and 20 hour movies um, differ with regard to the application. And so, as I mentioned in the high fidelity CCS mode, it makes sense to run 20 hour movies if you have long inserts, uh, maybe five, 10, 15, 20 kilobase inserts, because there, if you do want to get the highest single molecule accuracy, uh, you benefit from letting the polymerase run longer to collect more subreads. As I mentioned, um, uh, for the long inserts, um, the polymerases, the sequencing reads will have completed uh, most of them at 10 hours, so it doesn't make sense to extend the movie time faster. With regard to the um, number of reads, um, you will get about the same number from either 10 or 20 hour movies, about a half a million uh, reads at optimal loading. Thank you. Uh, and another question for you, Jonas. Can pre-extension be performed while another smart cell is being processed, or will the system not be acquiring data during that time? Yeah, absolutely. The pre-extension is uh, performed while another smart cell is being processed, absolutely. And so what it means is that in terms of overhead time, uh, the time is only spent on the very first smart cell of the up to 12 smart cell runs where the system would um, be in the pre-extension mode. But beyond that, there is no time penalty, no additional time penalty, because uh, as the question questioner mentioned, the pre-extension is happening while the previous smart cell is being uh, acquired. Okay, thank you. Uh, and jumping back to you, Dave, we have a question. The question is, have you been looking into structural differences between cave fish populations? And that's a really interesting thought, and I think it would be of pretty high interest. Uh, one of the challenges is getting um, enough members of the population to actually to do that analysis. They're actually quite um, exotic and, and um, rare uh, fishes to collect. Um, but with the, the low fold coverage that's necessary to get that structural variant information, I think it should be feasible and very cost effective. And then a question for uh, either one of you, um, or maybe both of you. Will uh, will this work with small insects for de novo genome sequencing, um, given small amount of starting DNA, less than uh, three micrograms? Uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll uh, start taking that. So yeah, um, we're we're very excited. We are working uh, on um, library preparation methods that can. Um, start with these much smaller amounts, specifically for insect genomes. So uh, this is something that's not released yet as a product, um, but um, this is something that we are uh, in collaborations with some researchers and are in initial testing, and that looks very promising. Um, I believe we will also uh, present this work at the uh, Plant Animal Genome Workshop um, and at Plant Animal Genome Conference and uh, as well. So, uh, but um, if uh, the questionnaire uh, questioner is interested, um, please uh, let us know, and then we'll uh, we'll see whether that's feasible at the uh, at this moment in time. But definitely uh, in the year 2019, um, we will have new developments and new protocols that will allow this to be done on small insects as well. And um, our hope is to, uh, and we have the first uh, use cases which we will present at the PAG meeting um, from single individuals of insects, which of course makes the de novo assembly much much. Um, simplified and much clearer because you only have two haplotypes and non-mixtures. Dave, did you, do, do you have any else to add in that regard? No, I, I think Jonas captured everything. Okay. Um, and then another question for the both of you. Um, have you made uh, a single pooled library for six microbial genome? 
maybe I can take the first one of that one. Uh, and, and yes, we have we we have multiplexed six. We've multiplexed higher than that as well. Um, typically, our uh, suggestions on when multiplexing is to look at the genome size and the coverage that's necessary and use that to formulate the best uh, multiplexing strategy. Yeah, exactly. And I can just add that I think our current target is between 30 and 40 megabases of total microbial genome content in the sample. And because microbial genomes have such uh, such a wide range of sizes, right? So H. pylori is 1.6 megabases and some other uh, streptomyces or so forth are almost 10 megabases. So um, depending on what kind of microbial genome size you have, you can adjust accordingly the uh, number of samples that you can multiplex in conjunction with our um, microbial multiplex application and protocols and kits. And so, you know, you can pool and sequence a lot more H. pylori than you could streptomyces. So the, um, the as Dave indicated, the total genome content um, is the criterion here. And I think the target right now for us is uh, between 30 and 40 megabases. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, we've got a lot of great questions coming in, but um, let's just take a couple of final questions. Um, first one for you, Jonas. Uh, question is, can pre-extension, um, or sorry, um, does uh, poly polymerase pre-extension resu uh, result in less total reads, as in does it result in wells that would have generated a partial subread that now will generate no data? Oh, right, yes. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's a good point, and I should have mentioned that um, we can compensate. So this is um, this would happen if you were to load at the same concentration. Um, and as I mentioned, the uh, the DNA that may be damaged or has a nick and will uh, not survive the pre-extension time would not then result in a in a read. But you can very easily compensate that um, for by uh, increasing the loading a little bit and get back to um, the optimal loading regime where you get the uh, the optimal number of reads. Because the polymerases that have ceased to uh, synthesize DNA and may still be present do not interfere with another polymerase nearby that successfully went through the pre-extension and will then give a nice sequence read. So um, the total amount of uh, material is a little bit higher, um, but uh, you can get to the same number of um, optimal, so the half a million reads or so, um, uh, with the pre-extension as well. And the final question uh, back to you, Jonas, uh, is at uh, 70x coverage, how effective is SQL in sequencing the centromere? Uh, yeah, so the centromere obviously is a very large region and highly repetitive. And um, there has been work uh, done uh, by Karen Miga and others, Jason Chin as well. And there's a, there's a tool actually available, Alpha Centauri, that has been described to uh, resolve more of the overall centromere structure. I think at the moment there's ongoing work to see how the high fidelity CCS reads um, can aid in further resolving the full structure of the centromere because it is known that there are sequence, that there are differences, that there are variation, uh, single nucleotide variation, there are some genes apparently in centromeres and so forth. Um, so 70 fold coverage is certainly a very good start. Um, and uh, uh, people are definitely looking at the centromeres as well in the context of the de novo assemblies. And I would say that's um, ongoing work uh, with regard to to what degree uh, the centromere can be illuminated. Certainly there is already some proven and published value, and I would certainly anticipate that that will continue. Thank you. And that's all the, uh, the time we have for questions. I do want to thank um, Jonas and Dave again for their time today and for everybody who participated in uh, listening and um, submitting these great questions. Uh, in, in ending, uh, as already mentioned, we have recorded this webinar and we'll make it available for download in the next several days. So keep an eye out for a follow-up email with a link to the recording. And in closing, I wanted to briefly mention three things. One is you can stay up to date on upcoming webinars as well as conferences and trade shows um, that PracBio is participating in and that you can come meet uh, with us at by visiting and bookmarking pacb.com slash events. If you're a Twitter user, uh, follow us uh, for the latest news and announcements related to our technology and our handle is at PacBio. 
And finally, as mentioned by Jonas, if you have an interesting research project that could benefit from smart sequencing, uh, please consider applying for a smart grant and you can stay up to date on available grants and the, uh, the deadlines for these grants at pacb.com slash smart grant. So thanks again for joining us today. I hope you'll join us again uh, on a future webinar. And with that, take care and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.